Richard mentioned, this is about the now emerging opportunities company. So it is a small cap or slash micro cap lick. Um, it's been around now. We listed about two, two and a half, almost three years ago now. So we're the first one after a number of years to lick. And then you've had a plethora of listed investment companies come to market. Uh, so it's a $50 million lick, uh, highly concentrated structure, unique in the essence that if I think we've got a comparison there of our portfolio relative to other people. So I think you get a lot of small cap or micro cap presenters coming up. But I think if you look at our portfolio there, you can see that the average market capitalization circa about maybe 50 to 100 million. We only own nine positions. And I say we're very pure and genuine in the nature that we do provide a long term exposure to micro cap and small cap companies. The unique ability is because it's a closed fund we don't suffer from liquidity issues. So people redeeming or applications coming in, it allows us to take big strategic long-term positions because we're not for sellers at the wrong time, which tends to happen in your standard unit trusts. Over the years, or almost three years, we've turned 50% pre-fees, so that is a pre-fee figure. Um, if you take, if you want to take the performance fees off and management fees, it works out to be about low 30s, give or take. The reason it's pre-fees is because that's the way most licks do them these days. In regards to dividends, so in gross returns, in gross dividends, we've given back over 20 cents to shareholders over the sort of two, 2.8 year period. Um, we average about a 6% uh, fully frank dividend. So it's about a 6% fully frank dividend since, uh, since February 2013. Get to the interesting bit. It's not a. It's not really talking about the products. Just talking about some interesting companies and why. Why we're investing in them and why we believe people should look at them. So, the top five represents about 70% of our portfolio. So we're extremely top heavy. We believe in conviction as opposed to diversification. Um, you know, to be honest, it's hard enough running nine companies, finding nine quality companies as opposed to 35 or 40. Um, so we'll just run through quickly our top five. So the first one we've spoken about a few times is a business called Anero. Used to be Photon Group as some may be aware that blew up many years ago. PR business capped at about 70, 70 million, I think, today. The big issue for this business is it can't pay dividends um, or do any buybacks for a number of years, so about two years left. It made about 9.5 million EBITDA off the top of my head. Um, it did grow last year. But the key is the revenue base is starting to sort of, I suppose, find a level and hopefully will increase with about two thirds of their earnings coming from the UK and the USA. So quite different to an STW communications, which some people would be aware of. Basically, if you look at the business, you strip out the cash at 70 million, 70 million market cap, 30 million in cash by the end of this financial year. We think it'll probably go close to making 12 million EBITDA. So for a PR business, very good cash flow. It's probably circa three times or less. But once again, a few big holders, the top three holders own about 60%, so it's a liquid. People tend to steer away from a business like this, but we think over time it will be a lot higher than where it is now. Second one, Lindsay Australia. So this is a logistics business, does refrigerated logistics, um, mainly across the East Coast, but now just opened up a big facility in Adelaide. Everyone wants to play the agriculture theme. I don't know, we've seen a lot of floats come to market recently, but a great way to play volumes in our view. So they do a lot of fresh fruit produce, import exporting. So if you're, if you're a farmer, they'll take the packaging to your farm. They'll then they'll package it for you. They'll then pick it up in their truck. They'll then take it to their logistics facility. They'll ripen it if it needs to be ripened. Then they'll send it onto a Qantas plane or to a Woolies depot or wherever it's going, and they'll do it all in one invoice as opposed to having 10 invoices. Obviously, there's demand for fruit and vegetables increases, it's a great way to play that theme because logistics is all about volume. And the key chart that we look at is the bottom left there. It just looks at exports of uh, fresh fruit and vegetables, mainly chilled or frozen. And as you can see, since 03, it's really done nothing in terms of dollars. So it's been about 150 to $200 million in regards to exports. We think that's changing. And we've heard a lot of anecdotal evidence. I think you saw the Costa Group AGM was a couple of weeks ago. There's a lot more focus now on exports because about 80% of fruit and vegetable goes to Woolies and Coles. And a lot of the growers want to get away from that. BSA, so this is a contracting business, heaven forbid. Um, Nick, a big turnaround, half a billion dollars in revenue. Nick Yates is the MD, has come into this about two years ago. He was the former head of infrastructure for Transfield, which is now broad spectrum, I think, uh, that received a bid the other day. Um, was really, the, I suppose, the jewel in the crown for that broad spectrum business, so he's highly regarded in the space. 500 million in revenue, 20 million dollars in cash, a net cash balance sheet. I think it's about a 60 million dollar market cap. 
it's had a lot of issues, this business, because it's had a big affiliation with Foxtel and doing a lot of installations, so people struggling to get their head around that. But Nick's brought the margins up to about 3.5%, and they have sort of management targets to get it close to 5 or 6. They're doing more in the aged care space. There'll be a big beneficiary from NBN. So because of the way NBN's changing now, they're using the, um, a different type of network, so it's fibre to the node as opposed to fibre to the home, whereby BSA should pick up an awful lot of work for that. So you've seen Service Stream does about 6% margins, BSA is 3.5. We'd expect to see some good news hopefully in the next few months and hopefully on a two times EBITDA multiple in the net cash balance sheet. Hopefully it should move higher over the coming years. My net phone, so a little bit different to the rest. Uh, in essence, it's a high growth business, does voice over internet protocol. Biggest clients include the likes of Skype and Google. So everyone talks about digital marketing. Um, that is true. More and more businesses use digital marketing. But a key issue that people don't pick up is that most people do need some form of telephony, uh, I suppose, added to that marketing piece. So you might click, you might find a Google ad. Um, you know, RBS Morgan's in Orange or whatever it may be, and you might need a 1-800 number or some form of um, phone number that's attached to that ad. MyNet phone provide all the click-through services, so you click through on your iPhone, you click that 1-800 number, it provides all the infrastructure for Google behind that. They own that, their entire network, it's all VoIP, VoIP, so it's not like in the ground cables. Um, and they've just acquired a big business out of New Zealand that has a worldwide network that used to be owned by Spark. So the idea being that a lot of their customers are now looking to use their MyNet phone services in Australia, but now they want to use them in Japan, they want to use them in the UK, and especially in the Asia-Pacific region, a bit like they have a reasonable affiliation with Superloop, but I know Morgan's here are reasonably close to as well. A great operator is upgraded year on year now for about four years in a row. Not cheap but a fantastic cash flow business and one of the last few remaining telcos in the space. The last one we'll invest in actually is a lick with just two investments. Uh, the main investment being, well, actually has three investments now. The main investment being a leasing book and a business they've just bought called Platform Group Australia. The reason why we like this business is if you look at the business they just bought um, and the people behind it, it was the former COO of Steadfast Group, which listed, obviously, and was an aggregator of the insurance broking business. The business they just bought is finance broking, so leasing, leases, things like that, are very much a cottage industry, looking to probably, we believe, over time, do a similar consolidation in that space. So they've got the platform, the digital platform behind it. Obviously, as brokers get bigger, the more scale you get, the better deal you can get with your funders. Then, obviously, the bigger ticket you can offer the brokers and entice them to move over. Very similar to a steadfast model, but a great annuity business at the same time. On the back of that, they also own a leasing book that's only revalued every 12 months. So obviously the brokers will use the leasing book, they'll fund the leasing book, and obviously that leasing book should grow significantly over time. So it's, a, it's an NTA play. We think NTA is probably north of 20 cents, but they only opt at it every 10 months, and we think the share price at 12 cents offers some significant upside over time. But once again, these five holdings represent about 70 to 75 percent of our fund. There's no options on issue. Uh, we have no listed options, no intention of raising any money. We're just looking to consolidate our share register and hopefully move the price higher over the next 12 months. So thank you.